can I have that napkin? Um, this will be worth an eBay around $2,300. Actually smells good. <laughs> Schwarzenegger fragrance, like the real thing. It is. Wow, isn't that kind of cool? Isn't that cool? <laughs> so before we start, I want to show you a picture. You and I have had the, uh, if you remember this picture, if we can show this picture, it's something that's been the most important moment of my life. You can watch right there on that screen, Governor, uh, right there. Do you remember this? Oh, yes. <laughs> I know, it was a wonderful moment. It you know, we moment. had such a great time. I know. It's, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but this is always, the, uh, Sly always does that. When, uh, for the next film, when he has someone in mind to star in it, he introduces them during the premiere of the movie, just like that. So you will be one of the next stars in his Expendables movie. That's, I appreciate that. That's, that's why he did that. I, I, uh, I think you need a new tie, though. We might have to solve that a little later. No, uh, it's, it's, it's very good. It's, it's very low key. Yes, and so in the next slide, uh, that was my double. Uh, that's Bruce Willis, so he's been, so when I can't make it, he replaces yeah, me. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get it. Yeah. I get it, yes. You just never know. That's why you're a great <laughs> promoter. <laughs> you make anything possible. Now, listen, uh, we and I talked earlier this week, and the, the drive to become number one, to be the best, to come to this country, to do whatever it takes, to have done it as we talked about, and we'll talk more about business. We talked about you've done it in bodybuilding, you've done it in real estate, you've done it in business, you did it as a governor, and now you're doing this, all these new things. At the end of the day, what, why? What is the drive to become Number one, deep down, you know, why not number two? Why not, how much is enough? How much money is enough? How much success, how much fame? Well, first of all, I think it's important to know that it is not with everything that you need to be number one. I mean, I can go out on the golf course and, you know, I know uh, and I'm enough in touch with reality that I would never be the number one golfer. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I try to improve my score but you know, there always will be someone around that is gonna shoot a 70 or an 80 and is gonna beat you in orders. It, then I look at golf then just as a game that you can do with your friends and that you have a great laugh when you're doing it and so on. But it's not like I gotta be number one and not enjoy the game then uh, because of the frustration in orders. So there's certain things like, for instance, when I wanted to find what is it that I could really excel in, in what sport in order to get me to America, I felt that when I stumbled on weightlifting, it wasn't really bodybuilding first, it was weightlifting. I got into Olympic lifting and everyone immediately said, look, you have an enormous potential in that. Look at the, the improvement, you have improved 100% in the bench press in just you know, four months. You know, your clean and jerk is really great. You, at the age of 16, we want you to be already a part of the team, of the weightlifting team and so on. So I grew very quickly and I responded to the weight resistance training very quickly. So I found my niche and it just happened to be that I saw at that same time that bodybuilding magazine that gave me then the blueprint to the whole thing. And it just sucked me in and I realized I can actually do exactly that. This is, this is exactly, so the important thing was really, and my message was that when you have a vision and you really believe 100% in that vision and you have faith in your vision that anything is possible, that is the extraordinary thing. If I would have started working out just to see what happens, that lift and lift, I could have lifted also five hours a day, but my body would have gone all over the place and I would have never really found that, that look that wins you the Mr. Universe title. So you got to have that vision and then you build your body slowly through with the exercises to get there. So it's, 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 it's a great joy when you find what you want to do. That is the key thing, I and mean, that's why I compared it to the ship. I mean, you can have the best ship in the world, but if it just drifts around, if you don't know where to go, I mean, you, you lost it. You're not gonna get anywhere. That's the important thing. So to me, the, the, what was also important was that all of the messages that I learned in sports, I could apply to anything else. So I, like I said earlier, I said to myself, well, I worked five, six hours every day on bodybuilding, and I, it worked. Let me work five, six hours a day also on my acting. And on, you know, the, the accent remover and the speeches and the, the acting coaches and all of those things. And it worked because I got better. 
I got more confident. I could go for readings and for interviews, and I got all of a sudden the parts in television and in movies, and I worked my, my, my way up. And the impossible became possible. That someone like myself that comes from Austria with a German accent that is, it is an absolute no-no, I ended up making you know, $30 million for Terminator 3, and it became the highest paid entertainer at that time in Hollywood. So I mean, that is like extraordinary that when until you, you have pay, that until, vision. Until you pay taxes, then you gave away but half it's okay. of it. I'm, I'm always happy to pay taxes. <laughs> because remember that, that, that I believe very much in America, and I believe what America has offered me, so I'm happy to pay taxes. I always tell my, my tax uh, uh, attorneys and everyone, if in doubt, pay more. Because, because... I don't know why you're clapping. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, I, I know there's a scandal right now with the IRS and all of this, things, which is inexcusable. And, you know, there's uh, uh, misuse of powers in government and in the private sector and in all of this. So, and hopefully they will, they will go after everyone that has been responsible for those kind of misuse of money and misuse of power. But in, in principle, to contribute to America, I was always uh, happy. When the, when, the, when the accountants came to me and they says, oh, you have to pay $15 million in taxes, I said, great, we must have made a lot of money last year. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means if you have to pay a lot of but, taxes. But as an entrepreneur, we're, and, and we'll talk about how you became an entrepreneur, people think you went from a bodybuilder to a, a superstar. There is a whole entrepreneur period where you actually became a real estate and a business millionaire. We'll touch that in, in a second, but as an entrepreneur, especially at this age, aren't you competitive to know the motivated? So if I came to you and said, uh, Governor, if we start this business, uh, I'm gonna give you, if you hire five people, we will deduct your taxes, we will give you more incentive, and if you earn more, you'll pay less because you're going to invest in infrastructure and investment, and as an entrepreneur, that makes sense. I will invest because makes I will get Makes total sense, makes so, total and sense. And we're driven because, by... Because my money is spent better if I invest it in, a big, in more business, expand my business because I hire job, I, I, I create jobs by doing that. Whereas if it sits with the government, they're not gonna manage the money as well as but you and I do. Here, but we still, the government still needs the money. So whatever they, you see, I, I sat there in that position as governor where we made changes in the laws in order to inspire people to invest more or to keep movies in, in California. We have the, the, the tax credit, the $500 million, so that people make movies here rather than going to another state. All of those things are very important. That's why you create those laws. I just don't have any patience for people that cheat and that go and have offshore corporations and all of those things. What about to get, moving to Vegas, which is a big problem in California. Where... That's still the United States. Right. It's, I, I, I'm talking about the United States. You can move around within the United States any way you want because then the money is still in the United States. Right. But to me, what is important is how do we keep this country number one? That's what I'm interested in. Not to have China get the edge on us. We got to be number one. We have been number one and America is the greatest country in the world. I've traveled all over. And it Canada, has been the most South Africa. it we has been the most here. powerful country in the world. <laughs> we have been more powerful than any dictatorship in the history. We've been more powerful than any feudal system or any democracy or anything. We are the number one country and the only way we keep it that way is, is by giving back to the country and also paying our taxes. That is just part of it and do business and work very hard. So you kind of ruined it for me. Um, <laughs> the tax, uh, that I ju you just added that to, uh, to a nightmare. But I always wanted to become president of the United States, but I was born in Canada. And when you I ran... feel so bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> People really don't like Canadians today. <laughs> uh, and I, when you became governor, I said, this is it. This is my moment. He's going to run for governor. He's going to terminate everybody. And <laughs> then he's going to go to Washington. They will change the amendment of Constitution. He will become president. Therefore, I will become president. What happened then? It's a great movie script. <laughs> but there's movies and there's reality. <laughs> would it be? But I, I, I tell you one thing. I just want to add that because I would have run, obviously, for president. Did you need um, a good vice president, Manager? Of course. Always. But, but 
I was never going to complain about that this one job I can't do. Because everything else that I have been able to do, I mean, it's extraordinary. The kind of things that I was able to do because I'm in America. So I'm not going to complain about the one job that I can't do. But you, you do won't hear want, me complain. You didn't want it, though. Yeah, but you there's did. two different things. To want it or to go and then go and to say, this what a stupid law. No, forget it. Uh, you know, there will be people down the line that will see that it's an outdated law. That there was a reason why they have written this in the Constitution, but now it's uh, it's, it's it's really not valid is there, is there anymore. Is there hope for us though? Uh, by, in this I, I, I don't think as long as there's someone around that wants to become president, they would never change the law. Trust me, it would never happen because it would take two thirds of the states and two thirds of the votes. I mean, it's very very hard to do a, a, a constitutional amendment to change the constitution. Uh, but it's perfectly fine because I remember I was at the Republican debate at the Ronald Reagan Library. And there were the Republican candidates standing up there. And uh, the moderator asked, he says, look, we have Governor Schwarzenegger sitting right in here in the audience, and he cannot run for president because he was form one. I said, would you want to change the law? Every one of those candidates, Republicans, said absolutely not. They didn't want me to stand up there with them. That's the last thing that these guys wanted. So they immediately said no. The only one that was a little bit diplomatic was McCain, who is, you know, a jewel. He's a, he's nice a, man. He's a witty, he's a very witty guy, and he's does he funny. You, does he's he call you funny. jerk too? Yeah, he, he calls he, me jerk all the time. No, but I mean, no, what no, he no, does no, is, <laughs> when he was asked, he says, "Would you change the constitution so Arnold can run?" He says, "Do you think if you have the Terminator sitting in front of you, you're going to say no?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he never said no or yes, but that was his answer. So he got out of it in a very smooth way. And you know, he and I, we of course are very good friends. Uh, Schwarzenegger, the businessman, the real estate investor. A lot of people don't know that side of you and how successful you own malls, businesses, uh, and you and I had talked off air how visionary you've been. Uh, probably that's probably shaped your whole entire career because you came to Hollywood with a business mind rather than coming from an artist perspective. Can you elaborate to that? Because a lot of people here are here for business. Well, first of all, I was very fortunate that when I went to school in Austria, the trade school, um, I learned how to be a salesman. And so I learned the art of selling and promoting and marketing. And I never realized then how important those skills are in everything that we do in life. It doesn't matter if you're an artist, a painter that needs to market his paintings, or if you're an athlete and you have to invest money and look over your business manager because you know, as you can see all the time, how athletes get screwed all the time by all of a sudden someone saying to them, well, we don't have any more money, you know, because the business manager ran off with the money. Um, entertainers that are broke, and cannot even pay the taxes and so on. So we see that all the time. So I did not realize then how important it is to have a business mind and to be able to sell and to market and promote and publicize and all those things. And those skills that I've learned then in school were important to me my whole life. And so it, it was, I had a, a, I developed a certain skill and a nose for real estate, for instance. When I came to America, I looked around and I was training down in Venice. And the Gold's Gym was in Venice. And as I was driving through Main Street, and I saw always, you know, the drunks and the homeless and the, the drug addicts lying around there on the street and so on, and I said to myself, you know, one day I see this street becoming a busy business street with restaurants and shops and all this. I see it differently 10, 20 years from now. And I started buying up buildings there. And sure enough, within a few years' uh, time, the property went up double, triple, quadruple. And I started you know, buildings that I bought with three houses in the back. For $450,000, I would sell three years later for $2.3 million. Then there was another house, a building down, uh, down the, the street that, that I bought in for a million and a half dollars. We sold for four and a half million dollars four years later. So there was unbelievable investments and opportunities. But for me, what was important was that my overall plan to become a leading man was such that I knew that if you sell out and you take those parts as a bouncer 
or as a wrestler or a Nazi officer, you would never make it to the top. So therefore, I wanted to be financially independent and have enough money that I never have to accept, accept those kind of parts. So I was able to hold out and slowly build my career because I had the financial security because of the real estate rather than from show business. Eventually, the show business took over and you know, when you start making 20, 30 million dollars a movie, no matter how well you invest on this side, I mean, this kind of money comes in in such staggering yeah. amounts. So, uh, but there was great thing to have and both. And there's some very good tax advantages but of yeah, exactly. real estate Absolutely, for over and then I got involved in businesses like uh, we started buying 747s uh, for Singapore Air, and they then leased it back for them uh, for themselves, and we got all the tax write-offs on that. So, I mean, there was great, great deals that I started making. Even though, again, they said it is impossible, you can't do that. He says the only financial institutions invest in those kind of airplanes, 747s for Singapore Air, they don't take private investors. And I had the team flying from Singapore, and because I was a celebrity, they were willing to do that, right? So they met in my office, I told them why I'm interested in this business, that I'm, I'm seriously wanting to invest in that, and that I'm a serious player, not just some crazy actor. And uh, after our conversations, they all agreed unanimously to let me invest in their planes, and I went in and had these great investments that uh, really ended up being an absolute jewel from a tax write-off point of view and also from an investment point of view. So you used the business, the real estate, the other business, to gain that financial security so that you can pursue a dream of acting without worrying with, uh, if you're gonna work at Starbucks. Is That's that, right, that yeah, because you never know exactly where it's gonna take you. Uh, but it was, I was very fortunate that, the, uh, that, that I started making money on all of those different areas. And I have to say that I really never lost any money on any of my investments that I, that I made. And I have never had a business manager. You handle your own finance, never, that was my next question. I never had a, a business manager. And I always had people that advised me on different areas, if it is stocks, if it is real estate and other, uh, other things, or like with the airplane, it was David Crane who was the expert on the airplane deals and so on, but I had people advising me but not managing my money per se, and uh, therefore I never got screwed by anybody. You and I talked off air and he said whether it was bodybuilding, real estate, business, actor, governor, and even now, that coaching, getting the best people to coach you and to pay for that advice, to tell you exactly what to do was a very big difference maker. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you need advice. I mean, uh, look, it, it doesn't matter if you are uh, wanting to find out about nutrition. You want to get the best advice about nutrition because there's so many different supplements out there. And uh, if you're not an expert in reading the labels, you better get someone that really can help you with that. And the same is also if you want to get into uh, sports, if you want to have some medical advice, you need people to advise you. If you want to make great investments, you need people to advise you. I am a strong believer that you should get all the help that is out there, and uh, you shouldn't be shy about that. And so I think those uh, kind of uh, also inspirational books, if it is self-help books and stuff like that, all of this is good. We need daily to be inspired. We need daily advice. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves, that's why we always say, like, you are a self-made man, but yeah. not really, right? I mean, it's a saying, and I'm a self-made man, but if I think about just in a movie, I just finished a movie, that's why I have this little crazy haircut uh, with a short on the side here. It always looks uh, the same always, to me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, in, in that movie, I have a director. He's directing me. I mean, without the direction, you cannot really act. I mean, you can, but I mean, you would not have a continuity in the movie to tell a story, so you need a director that directs you. Uh, the best actors in the world need a director to direct them. You need a producer that raises the money and that puts the money up so they, and produce the movie. You need the makeup artist to do the makeup. You need the stunt coordinator to coordinate the stunts and all the action. And you need the camera people to do it. So you have on a set 150 people that make you look good. So how can I say I'm a self-made man when there's 150 people alone there doing the movie? So you have to give recognition, so recognition is true. When uh, I've read your book, and when I announced that you were going to be the headliner, the excitement all around the world it had made instant news, and people immediately booked. But there were some people said you had made some mistakes, and they said, 
you know, if you don't ask him about it, it'd be hypocritical. You've talked about it in your book, so talk about some of the mistakes that, that you have made and the lessons that we can all learn from that and things that you would do differently going forward. Well, I mean, it's always uh, easy to be smart in hindsight, right? I mean, uh, of course I would do things differently. And uh, I am the first one to say that I have fallen many times in my career. And uh, if it is uh, with films and uh, with, uh, you know, have lost competitions. And, but I think the biggest screw up was in my personal life uh, with my marriage. And I regret that, obviously. And, um, you know, it, I, I felt bad for the family, that the family has broken up because of that. Uh, and now we are trying to hold it together. And my wife has been really terrific. Uh, with all that and with raising the kids. Um, uh, you know, she has been a great partner all along and we are uh, on important uh, days. If it is, uh, you know, Easter or Christmas or birthdays or graduation days or Mother's Day or Valentine's Day, whatever those special days are, you know, there's... Uh, 50 of those a year, um, anniversaries and all those How things. How important is family? You, you, said you, love, you love your kids, and I've, I've talked to a lot of people and said you are a phenomenal father. You've always been there for your kids. Um, talk about the importance of family, and how do you balance, you know, you're going to Australia tomorrow morning, you film until 5 a.m. a couple of days ago. Everybody wants something. You were governor being pulled in different directions. Everyone talks to you, wants something from you. So how have you been able to balance success, fame, and family? Well, I wasn't always successful. I mean, we always try. Like when you're governor and you swear that you're gonna represent the 38 million people, then you have this continuous fight in your own head about who do you now choose first? Is it the state or is it the family? So I was working in Sacramento and my family was living down here in Los Angeles. So I worked to seven, eight o'clock at night, and then I flew home, I got home at nine, 10 o'clock at night. Then I had to put the kids to bed and read uh, bedtime stories to them and so on. But it wasn't always enough, because I can tell you that one day we were all having dinner. And then all of a sudden my daughter started crying on the dinner table, and she said, Daddy, you did not come to my recital today. I said, darling, I know at five o'clock was your recital, but I had to stay in Sacramento because we were right now negotiating the budget and I couldn't just get up and leave. So then the next kid started crying and saying, yeah, you didn't come to my football game on Saturday. And then the next kid started crying and then Maria said, okay, just explain to your daddy how you feel and all this. And then all of a sudden, the whole table was crying, including my wife. You have animals too, they were crying too? They probably were, but I didn't see it. But imagine, so, so you're sitting there that did it hurt inside? And, and you, well, it's, it's, like, it's like mass confusion because, you know, you, you try to be as good a governor as you can, but you're also trying to be as good a, a husband and as, as a father and all this, and it all jams together, you know, and it is, it's one of those very unusual situations. Um, it's, it's no different than when soldiers, uh, you know, leave to go to Iraq or to Afghanistan or somewhere like that, and all of a sudden, you know, the family is there without this man or without this woman that is leaving, and it's, it's kind of the same thing. So it's a very tough situation uh, that you're in, but I did come home two days more uh, uh, during the week rather than spending four days in Sacramento. I spent only two days in Sacramento and came home two more days, and that really took the pressure off, and the kids were happy with that, and there was around more, and they saw me more often. But then often the media and stuff then jumped on and said, you were never in Sacramento, so how do you balance yeah, that criticism now? Yeah, but I now? mean, again, again, if you have the choice between bad uh, media coverage versus you know, doing something for your family, I'd rather do something for the family and let the media do their job, whatever they do well, which is to criticize and do the, the, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the little thing, so that was okay. Uh, fame. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anyone on the planet who doesn't know who you are, and just the movies, the everything you've done. Um, obviously, when you start off, it's good. Now, looking back at it, 
Um, is fame, in your opinion, cut out to all its be? It, I don't know, take some privacy everywhere you go. People want pictures or follow you or looking for you to trip up something. How do you handle it? Have you accepted it? Do you wish it just kind of just stopped and you can be just a, a regular guy again? Well, there's no such thing as the perfect deal, right? I mean, you can't have both. And uh, you can't have uh, being the most popular and having people go to your movies, but then when they see you in the street, not to get excited over you and jump all over you and say, can I have your autograph? Can you sign this post again? This, that. Like when I drive in the, the movie set, I have sometimes you know, 20, 30 people standing out in front of the gate when you drive into the studio, they don't have, hold their posters, hold your posters in their hand and they want you to sign. So what are you gonna do? Just drive by and not sign it? Um, you could, but that's not cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's a... Uh, uh, so you maybe drive by a few times, but then eventually you stop when you have time, and you spend that half hour, and you sign those posters and the pictures and the baseballs and all of this uh, stuff. So that, that's just the way it is. I mean, I always say, that uh, if it is, uh, you know, too hot, get out of the kitchen. You know, I could walk out of that and just say, look, I want to ask everyone for my privacy. I'm not going to make any more movies. I'm not going to do any more public appearances. And I think that people will respect that. But then that means I'm going to get out of there. And I'm not about to say that because I'm having a great time. I, from the time I was 15 years old and I discovered the first thing that was mine, which was bodybuilding, from that point on, I took control over my life and I felt like I was on this ride, on this joy ride, even though there were unbelievable struggles uh, and hard work. But it was such a joy ride because I always knew where I was going and there was always an end, the great Bay Day. And uh, so I, I would not exchange my life for anyone's life in the world. It was, has been so wonderful, and I was also very fortunate that I had great parents, um, that my father gave me the discipline, because he was a military guy, so he in indoctrinated me the discipline and hard work. He always said, no matter what you do, son, you gotta be useful. That was the most important thing he always said, is to be useful. And uh, my mother gave me the love and the care my mother would be sitting there with me after school and do my homework with me. And when I was refusing to do the homework, which sometimes you do, she pulled out the yardstick and whack and hit me <laughs> over the, the, my hands. And um, then I went right back again and did my homework. And today I look back and I thank her for that because sometimes when you're a kid, you're unruly. And um, we don't believe in that today anymore. It's a different time. But in those days, this was quite normal that the teacher would smack you and the, the parents would hit you with a yardstick or something like that. And it was good because uh, she made me study. And now I look back and I say, I'm so glad that, that she made me do the homework and the teachers made me study and become smart and all this. So I was, you know, I, I have had the greatest life and uh, with, with great love and all this. And, um, and with ups and downs, a life that ups and downs, but an overall a great joy ride. I'm gonna give you, um, you're gonna, I'm gonna use some, some names and I want you to give me a one word uh, description of it. So if people say Arnold Schwarzenegger, first thing that comes to your mind. Motivated. Uh, Sylvester Stallone. Artist. President Obama. Visionary. Donald Trump. Great businessman. Nelson Mandela. A great human being. JT Fox. <laughs> this is my moment. A great, a great visionary, a great Look, business more than leader, one word. a great buddy, an absolute must to have and to listen to. So all of those things. You are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, uh, hold I on, ladies, I get it now. <laughs> I get I, uh, it. I just want to, to, to add, because I know Nelson Mandela is very Yeah, there's many, of uh, uh, clap if you're uh, South uh, African here. Uh, he's, uh, he's very ill. I was very fortunate 
to stand with him in his prison cell at Robben Island during the promotion of Special Olympics. And during the time I had a little bit of time to talk to him about his imprisonment and all this, and the way he spoke about forgiveness, it was the most powerful thing that I've ever heard. It almost brought tears to my eyes. I mean, there's a man that was locked up for 27 years by whites, and then the first thing he does when he gets out of prison, visits the, the, the wife of the prosecutor that put him in there in jail in the first place, a white woman, and then not at all to be interested in revenge. Forgiveness. But to go and preach forgiveness and to bring blacks and whites and colors and uh, Asians and all these different categories that they have in South Africa, uh, to bring them all together and to unite the country. And it, they would take a long time in all of those things, like in Russia, there's still this organization there and corruption and all those things, but it would take them a long time to get out of communism and to get organized. The same is in South Africa, to get, to get a, a united country and to really have that locked in. It would take another probably decade or two, but he started it. And that to me is such an extraordinary human being and such a great idol. So we, I mean, to, to learn from someone like that, because we all have this thing, if someone does something to you, you want to pay them back, right? It's a human nature. Eh, I'm gonna get that guy, you know, I'm gonna get the, you know. Wouldn't know anything but, about that. Yeah, no, <laughs> but I mean, you know, but when you listen to Nelson Mandela, it just makes you realize that's really where the action is. But do you realize in, in yourself uh, how many people you have inspired to take their life, to follow their dreams, to come to this great country, to, to just you know, go out there and go big or go home. I, I don't know if you realize, one of the, I remember because the, I, you know, I've watched every movie and obviously uh, growing up you idolize. For a while I used to put the Rambo bandana but my mother wouldn't let me anymore so we switched over to your movie. Was, okay, uh, good. And then I couldn't yeah, lift the dumbbell. Good taste. You could taste, yes. <laughs> no, uh, no, but I mean, look, I was, uh, as I said, I was inspired by Reg Park. I mean, he is the one that really was responsible. And I told him that many times, way before he passed away. Um, you know, what an inspiration he was. And I wanted to be that kind of an inspiration to millions of other people. And the same thing is with the Nelson Mandela, with the Gorbachev, Reagan, and those people that were a great inspiration to me to be a public servant and to think bigger than just, rather than just think about myself. I want to be an inspiration to millions of people for that also. That's why we have the Schwarzenegger Institute at And that's USC. why you speak, correct? Yeah, you, you're you're right. not here because of the money and, and you're flying to Australia to inspire more entrepreneurs. Is, is it another I, speaking, I think, another venue to get your message out? I think that there's many ways to get the message out and this is one way to get the message out, you know, that people can listen to you and, uh, and hear you talk and inspire people. I mean, that's, uh, I think I was inspired continuously by many people and so I want to do the same thing. That's why I said earlier, it's so important not to just take, but to give. Think about it all the time. What can you do to give something back? A uh, couple more questions. You give them a round of applause. That's a great answer. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a few questions, and we're going to wrap up of things I've always wanted to, to ask you. I love when you say California. Can you say it for me? California. Ah, that's all. <laughs> now, I would like you to say it in an American accent now. California. No, no, it sounds the same. <laughs> I tried. California, have you tried that? California. But that's not the way, that's the right way to say it. It's not? I mean, everyone would tell you that the way I pronounce it is actually the right way to say it. <laughs> Who's gonna argue with a Terminator? California. Uh, just, just so that we know, you're working on a movie and what, what's the movie pipeline? Like, what, is it action movies you want to do, comedies? Is it, what kind of the, just to get into the, in case they give me a job on entertainment tonight, I want to have this real. That's very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like both. I like comedy and action movies. Um, I think that the people have shown that they're interested in both. Uh, my movies like Twins and Kindergarten Cop have been highly successful. Can you pop up a couple of lines? And uh, from what? Just uh, I, kindergarten cop. Like, yeah, just wh whatever comes to your mind. Bunch of famous lines you have. It's not a tumor. <laughs> Stick around. 
and then the knife goes through yeah, the chest, right? Not that part. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. I'm a cop, you idiot! I yeah. played that. <laughs> um, when you were back there and you were Get watching, to the chopper! <laughs> I'm saving the, the last one, the last one, the, the famous in Terminator, you're saving that one for last. But when we were backstage, there was a whole video clip of you bodybuilding and a series of movie. When you see that, um, at this point in your life, does that still kind of give you some butterflies? Or you've seen it, you've heard it so many times that it's just like, okay, I've seen it, done that before. Or does it still up here, you know, give you that, that emotional thing in your brain that says, wow, that's, you know, amazing, or like a recap? Um, I would say that for years I ignored it, you know, because I saw it so many times that when I saw it, it didn't really mean Did anything. Did you watch Terminator 2 last night on TNT? Uh, I, no, I, it was I on. never watched it. I watched television. it. Yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you that the day, because I think time, so much time has passed since then, now I'm looking at it in a different way. Because now I look at it, you know, kind of like I'm 65 years old now, and I'm looking at this body and I say, wow, <laughs> it's amazing that I once had that body. <laughs> do you still, do you still work out? And, and how long a day do you, do you work out? Because I work out every day. I, uh, I do cardiovascular training every day for around the half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I do weight training around half hour to 45 minutes. Rick, I'm gonna give you this one chance in this one moment. If you, whoa, before you get up, you gotta, this is the deal. You have to come up here and take off your jacket, your tie, and your shirt and flex for Arnold. You got one shot at this. You got one shot at this. This is your moment. This is your moment. This is your last shot. This is your dream. No, well, Arnold's not gonna do it. That's an extra 500,000. Know so. <laughs> that was a la carte, and I decided, well, we'll skip that. Uh, well, Arnold, I, you know, I have a tie company, it has a million other things, and I saw this, and I ordered it, and it's, I decided to call it, because you, that tie you had over there, it's embarrassing. We need to talk about that. And it's the JT Fox tie, and I call it the Governor Gray. And see, look at that, right? <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. No, I'm going to take it back now. It costs money. <laughs> yeah. It costs money. So I have one. Uh, well, first, before, we do, before I ask you, I'm going to ask you for final words, and I'm asking you for one more request. These people have come all over the world. 800 of the world's most successful people. I use billionaires, multimillionaires, South Africans, Canadians. I don't know if they like you anymore. You know, it's been a rough Austrians. day. Austrians? Is there anybody from Austria? Ah, there's one from us here. Yeah. So, Greece, I mean, they're, they're like everywhere. And they came to see you. They came to be inspired, which you did a phenomenal job, by the way. An amazing speech, and it'll forever be burnt in here. Again, I'm gonna... what, what final advice do you have for all of us as we are continuing for two more days and we're going to go into our respective lives trying to change the world and do what we do? What advice do you have for us so that we can continue having a legacy and, and, and your inspirational words? Well, I think that the overall uh, advice I give always to people is, is stay hungry. I think as long as we are hungry for improving ourselves, uh, hungry for doing better in business, hungry to do better in our relationships, hungry to do better in what we give back to the world and all of those things. Stay hungry. That is the most important thing because that's what motivates you. Being hungry is what motivates you. And I think also there is one thing that I uh, wanted to mention and that is um, that I was always a big promoter and now I'm on a crusade, kind of like my fitness crusade, I was for four decades on a fitness crusade. You're an activist now. now I'm a, a yeah, activist. Like but a, now I'm on a, on, a, on a crusade, an environmental crusade. Because I think we, we cannot continue to go down the route that we are going. We're using fossil fuels and um, creating the kind of pollution that we're creating. I mean, we see the weather's change. We see the sea levels rise. I mean, the latest study has shown uh, we see the kind of health impact that it has. 
There's millions of people that die every year around the world because of pollution, of soil pollution, air pollution, and water pollution. I think that we can do so much better than that because the technology is available. But if we wait for, again, for government to take care of that, it's going to take a long time. I am a big believer that all great movements have started on a grassroots level, uh, just on a small level. The, the great movements never come from a capital. They never come from Washington. They never come from London or Moscow or Beijing or any of those places. They come from people, ordinary people that rise up. If it is the civil rights movement, if it is the suffrage movement that gave women the right to vote, if it is the independence movement in India, if it is the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, it was never the capitals that did that. It was people that did that. And I think the same is the case now with the environmental movement. We got to protect our earth. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, eventually the tip tipping point is going to come where it's too late. Uh, will you be back in, at Mega Partnering? I'll be back. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I think you should wear these. <laughs> I think I will wear these. Oh, these are bigger ones. There's, these are cheaper, I, you know. <laughs> and, and what I'd like, I had a dream, to stand in front of you, for you to say that, and for us to flex, to see what Rick could have been doing, but did not. And I would like to take that pose as a dream come true. Ladies and gentlemen, JT Fox, oh, get your cameras out. <laughs> so you have the final word, Governor. I'll be back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger.